Um, this is an exhibition that's in all of the Gabbett Brewster gallery space. It's just open today, so this is the first morning that people have been able to come in and see it. And actually some of the last works just arrived yesterday, so it literally is fresh into the gallery. It's an exhibition looking at two artists' works who have um, never actually even met each other, except on Zoom. Uh, and uh, the reason for bringing their work together is that they both hark back in their ancestry to Persia, to the Empire of Persia, a thousand-year-old empire that existed for many hundreds of years and had an expanse of about five million kilometres centred around Iran, but reached as far as into Baltic states and down to Egypt as well, so included uh, parts of Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. So covered a huge expanse of area and of course was a, a great empire at the time for creating a lot of the things that we still have in our civilization. Uh, a lot of literature, poetry, ideas of civil service. I think even the post office first originated in Persia. So um, in a very sort of intellectual but also early uh, way of thinking about testing. shifts towards um, societal life. Testing. So these two artists come from different parts of Persia. Riz Kaki, whose work we see here on this side of the gallery, uh, whose family was Zoroastrian, who had moved into India to escape the persecution of Zoroastrian religion, uh, which is a monotheistic religion, one of the first um, religions looking at a single divinity. Um, excuse me, thank you. Is that okay? Is that working? It's all. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, who, who moved to Gujarat, uh, were accepted by the Indian uh, state at that time as not being able to, who had to assimilate and not being able to sort of practice differently. Uh, so a culture which was very pacifist and then was able to survive and very much now there's a few colonies of Parsi people, particularly in Mumbai, where Ariza's family come from, still have their family apartment there, uh, where his grandparents and parents lived and where he lived for a short time before his family moved here to Auckland. So Reeves has been a man who hasn't really been so connected physically with that culture but has absorbed it very much through the matriarchal line in his family, particularly as you can see working with them to understand embroidery techniques and also beading techniques that his Aunt Dolly taught him, which isn't the case here, um, and then himself going on research trips back to Iran, exploring the ruins that still exist there, uh, the fire temples that he could enter in uh, India as well, um, looking at the embroidery traditions which still exist and of course going to other parts of the world to see Persian history inside museums and other institutions. So he's drawn very much on the imagery both that he's been able to collect from those research trips, uh, looking at architectural fragments, but also was initiated into the Zoroastrian religion as a young man at age 10. So was able to be part of those uh, fire temples which still exist in places like Mumbai. And some of his works in this area down the other end of the room here reference uh, the characteristics of those temples that you'll find there. The fire, the pomegranate tree, the well uh, and other experiences as well. But they're very much works for a reason but also exploring a biographical identity in a way how he's trying to um, make his way in the world as a queer man, how he thinks about this early life and its impression on him and his family, and where he'd like to be able to celebrate that ancestry as well as sort of question, critique it as well. And you'll find lots of different symbolism in his work that tells parts of fragmented narratives, and that's the way he likes to sort of think about telling a story, we could like to say, um, that life is full of many fragments it's as much an experience of a fire temple as it is the memory of his mother's stenography notebook and some of the little details come out of that source as well. Or it might be a memory of sitting at a desk in his parents' apartment, the blue desk down here, or looking out the window from the Parsi colony. So you'll see a lot of these memories in Ariza's work as well as references that he might be drawing on from much more ancient Persian culture as well. And the case here where the bead fragments are literally reference a lot of that history that's been taken into museums and in a sense colonised out of history. So it, objects that he's represented in there include um, ceramics, fragments of friezes, 
also stories that have survived that he's illustrating in there as well. So he's talking about that collection of history that isn't personal but it's much more institutional and how your history might end up being somewhere locked away in a museum collection as well. And sort of ironically he's bringing it back to us in a museum case in an art gallery too. So beautiful embroidery from Ariz and obviously you can see here too, he also uses domestic cloths. Most of these come from the family home. They were either his grandparents or parents or that they still existed in his house somewhere. And some of them are new. He has bought them uh, on trips back to Mumbai and other places. And particularly in Mumbai, there's quite a Parsi textile industry existing still. So he's still able to source some of the cloths that he uses. But that domestic sense coming through working on things that you know we would reference probably as tea towels or dust cloths very much is part of how he's also trying to sort of imbue the memory and the physicality of his work with the stories that he's trying to tell as well. There's lots of information on the wall text I won't go into the narratives in each of the works but I'll just give you an overall impression as we sort of walk through the gallery space. We'll just move over to Kadim's work on this side. So as I mentioned, Kadim's ancestry is from Afghanistan and he grew up in a family connected back to the Hazara people who derived from the central area of Afghanistan, which we know as Bamiyan. And I think we can all think about Bamiyan as being a place where there are so many hundreds of Buddhist temples and caves and statues hidden away in the caves in those areas. And you can see that literally represented in some of these works here behind me. The Hazara people uh, would technically be known as an ethnic group in Afghanistan. They've existed for many centuries. Um, they were there at that Buddhist time in the 9th century, in, in the, sorry, 6th century when those Buddhist, most of those sculptures were carved. It was a place that the Silk Road went through, so there was lots of interaction with other parts of Asia as well. Um, a lot of scholars went through that place, so it has a very rich and deep history as well. There's even journals of people seeing those Buddhist sculptures as they transferred through that area. The Zara's are very proud people, but they have been discriminated against a lot in that place. Uh, they have been a minority. Uh, there have been many battles fought uh, with different ethnic groups in Afghanistan over the centuries. I think 65% of the Hazara population were wiped out a couple of centuries ago in, in quite a large um, campaign that was fought against them. And of course Hazara have had to um, convert to Islam and uh, over time and they are Shia Muslims and so of course there's a Sunni majority in Afghanistan that also discriminate against Shia. So unfortunately they've been on the um, wrong side of history, we could say, um, for a long time. But that I think even makes people even more determined to celebrate their culture and for it to persist as well. So um, Kadim's really lived that history. He comes from a family where his grandfather was a singer of Persian epic stories, and particularly the Shah Manar, which was written by Ferdowsi in about 1000 BC to really try and keep Persian culture alive. So it's one of those really epic poems of 50,000 stanzas, like Homeric epics in Greece, which tell historical stories of battles and courtly life, but also partly mythologise that and bring in other imaginary aspects as well. But it's a great book of, um, for Persians, uh, and everybody really knows that. And then other um, poetry as well, um, Kadim has been brought up with. But particularly important is that his grandfather knew the um, Book of Kings, the Shamana, by heart. He was a singer of those epics, and I think that really informed the way that Kadim thought about himself perpetuating his culture as well. But he's taken a different route. So he grew up in Pakistan because the family had to exile there, and went to art college in Lahore, where he learned miniature painting. It's one of the last places where you can learn traditional Mughal miniature painting, which derived out of India. So he learned the style of painting that you can see in the paintings down here on the wall where you're conveying uh, great scenes from those histories or uh, love scenes at the court or other detailed representational scenes as well. Um, so 
for Kadim, he's, he's come through not only knowing that history but now depicting it as well. And started with much smaller paintings than you can see here. We're giving a little survey of the background of both artists' work so you can see how the work's changed over time. And literally, for Kadim, I think a lot of the imagery that you see here is thinking about how Hazara people have been thought about, um, reported in history. They've been called um, demons, and hence you get this sense of these demon figures. Uh, they've been said to be less than animals. So they've very much been perpetuated in a very negative stereotype. And for a long time, Kadim thought that he was a sort of like a hero. He was like Rustam in the Book of Kings, that he could be um, a, a great person. But then he realised that, of course, even those heroes in the end die, and they're often also on the bad side of history as well. So this demon is like a double-sided figure. There's usually a light and a dark coloured demon. Uh, often the demons then have these angel wings, so are they good or are they bad? He's really questioning the way that uh, we depict uh, and think about people over time through his own particular eyes. And through that he's used a sort of sense now about also looking at political, geopolitical life in the world that he comes from, uh, drawing on these stories too. So you see, for example, down here, one of the fourth Mughal kings who was said to be a great man, bringing peace to a region, but of course he was a warrior as well. Um, and then Kadim conflates this also with what else has happened in Afghanistan and particularly the Allied forces being there in the last 20 years when he's been able to go backward and forwards to that country and work with people there as well. So it's a sense of, you know, are these armed forces bringing good and democracy, which is what they said they would do. Uh, and then recently, last year, of course, we saw all that fall apart when everybody just evacuated and left people behind. And so this really recent work here by Kadim depicts, in a sense, that expansive history from the 6th century Buddhas and their destruction uh, through to now he's added a recent element to it, which is, of course, people running into the airport at Kabul and trying to escape on those final planes. Um, amazing work, and he, when he made it, he said to us, oh, why don't we put it on a carpet, because actually I'm referencing the war carpets that come out of Afghanistan, which pretty much have been made for a tourist trade. Often they're a bit smaller than these size carpets, and they just depict images people have found of war scenes, usually across time. They can be all sorts of things. They can be taken from a Red Cross picture through to historical miniature images again, or something really contemporary. Uh, as you can see, Kadim here and his weavers have put together. So we might move through upstairs, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments as we go, but we might just move up to sort of the next level in the gallery uh, and stop there. And you can see the artist here talking on an interview if you've got time to sit down and have a listen later on. And a beautiful group of works uh, by Rees over here on this side that he's made uh, new for the exhibition, three panels from a series called the Emblemata series, where he's looked at some of the friezes from Persepolis, from the ruins that still exist or have now been taken into museums, and taken some um, fragmentary ideas from them. For example, the one on the left-hand side references a frieze where two men were standing together and touching. And he felt this was a sort of very pertinent image that spoke to him, particularly about the possible existence of you know, gay culture potentially in um, Persepolis at the time that he would then now relate to as an artist today and a man today. And then on the far right hand side, an image of hand holding a flower, a crocus flower, which he also took from one of those fragmented friezes, and then has made into this beautiful design of sort of animistic elements of snail shells as well, and sort of ideas of identity emerging and re-emerging out of this organic scene. And the beautiful watercolours down here are like working references for Arise, images that he's created to draw from and create his embroideries and take from those um, sketches, we could call them in that way. And the other item that's here is uh, really quite special for us, and it's on loan to us from Auckland Museum, in the case around the corner here. And it's an example that actually Arise found and alerted us to of Farsi embroidery, so Persian embroidery, uh, which is really quite historical. It's a lovely small um, jubbler or tunic that it would be a boy's size. Oh, you're just probably too old for it. But um, you can see the delightful embroidery and it includes peacocks and figures that we will see elsewhere um, and a lot of botanical plant elements as well. 
So most Persian homes would have had um, lots of embroidery in them. They would have had a room where there was an embroidery cupboard, uh, where the family would have, the women would have been undertaking embroidery and um, sharing embroidery, lots of garments embroidered, and also the beadwork that you saw downstairs would have traditionally been hung over a doorway, a welcoming doorway uh, into the household, and they're glass beads that are sewn together. So uh, coming from a tradition which is very much this type of practice, and particularly embroidery, is very much mured into everyday life in a way that it's not anymore and it's, and it's certainly not so much in a Western culture. So we just wanted to include that as well just to show an example, I guess a living example, um, of how people would have had not only sort of domestic embroideries but it would be very much also on the body. Right, let's keep going upstairs. <coughs> so again in this space we've got four works by Kadim. Earlier works that um, range across the last decade. You can see here the continuation of that idea how he has worked on different scales, sometimes small scale but also larger scales using his painting uh, technique and traditions and continuing to reference those demon and angel figures amongst the Buddhas. And in the background of this work on the left here at each end you can see the head of a reclining Buddha beautiful uh, figure, which is actually a story that this Buddha did exist from the journals of a Chinese traveller who came up and down the Silk Road and was uh, said to be a 19 metre long reclining Buddha in one of the caves in Bamiyan. And actually recently, just about a decade ago, some fragments of it were found, so it was a true story. So it begins reference, again, this history, connections with Asia, and um, I guess the, the type of troubled identity of the people who come from that region as well. Really different work on the other far side there, but again you can see how it can use that miniature painting tradition. It's not like paintings that we're really used to looking at that have a Renaissance perspective or the idea of, of a perspective within the image that comes from the Renaissance period. Mughal painting was pre-Renaissance time, so it does very much have a very sort of flat, flat illusionism. Uh, and here, Kadim's landscape is full of figures who are fleeing from the fire. And obviously, it seems to be an Australian landscape because it's full of marsupials and kangaroos and um, flying angels coming in to save them. So this image is a reference to his response to the horrific 2020 bushfires in uh, New South Wales and other parts of Australia. And the fact that, um, of course, here we can see I guess another side of the demonic side of our world if we think about climate change and some of the things that uh, humans have been doing to bring that about in our world, including like fossil fuels, for etc. So he's really pick, picking very stereotypical uh, examples of those animals, drawing on some photography of protesters as well, but again bringing in elements from the traditional images that he works with in terms of the flames, the angels coming down, but this time they've got fire hydrants, uh, and merging together things from his own, um, his own identity and experience to create this, this concept in this image. In uh, 2011, Kadim's family who were still living in Quetta, their house uh, was literally destroyed by a uh, car bomb, the Taliban, Taliban car bomb. And the only thing that really remained, uh, luckily they weren't in the house, the only thing that really remained from that were some rugs and textiles. And this gave him the idea that this was a really resilient medium and that maybe this was a way he could uh, work forward because he did have a number of artworks in the house as well which were destroyed. So he loved the fact that these carpets, which had existed for quite a long time in his family, had survived through that horrific incident. So it made him think actually about working with those types of materials and this has been something that he's really continued on uh, throughout his practice since that time. And it's also a way that he can work collaboratively because it's, he doesn't necessarily do all of this work now, he still paints, does the animation and things like that, but he's working with a lot of other people now to create these works. So he started literally working on carpets as you can see here with this what we call a Persian rug. Um, and here we see the demon figures again, but it probably does remind you a little bit of some of our images from European art history. 
we think about maybe the raft of the Medusa and those images where we're seeing people washed up or trying to trying to, to flee and survive at sea. And Kadim was able to move to Australia on a visa in 2009. So at this time he was living in Sydney, he's still living there now. But if you were living in Australia around that time or in subsequent years, literally every day what you heard on the news were, the, were these um, terrible, um, aggressive refugees who would be coming to your coastline by boats from other places and you know, illegal immigrants who were boat people who would be invading your country which was a sort of spin put on it by the government at that time, who didn't want anyone to be entering the country uh, without coming through immigration channels at airports. And so Kadim literally felt like he also was maybe one of these people again who was trying to come to a place of safety, but you know, these people were like him, they were sort of being abandoned and left afloat, literally, uh, because they were different uh, to people to, in the country that they were trying to head for. And so he's used beautiful embroidery techniques with the people he was working with and again a range of different types of illustrations which include uh, demons, sea demons and dragons that he's taken from, uh, again, from the miniature painting. But even the foam on the sea is embroidered, this whole scene is embroidered um, in a beautiful way that really makes it uh, shine and sing and the skin tones, things like that. So this was, these images are sort of a fairly personal statement for uh, Kadim and the people that he's thinking about, but really they do also apply much more generally and socially when we think about some of the topics that he's dealing with around ideas of home and identity. And so the textile works became more, uh, we could say, complicated after this time. Um, and you can see this work from 2015, which is on this wall here which is literally a representation taken from a miniature painting that has been enlarged through the method of embroidery uh, with Kadim working with uh, his artists and artisans. So it's a scene of a great battle. We've got a uh, aspiring general here who was able to take over one of the Mughal armies. The, the emperor's king, uh, the, sorry, the emperor's son at the time was very jealous of the way that this other guy was able to come in and take over the army and get lots of favours. And so there was a great battle ensuing between these two, which ended up in the aspiring uh, general, of course, being killed at the time. And there's a fairly uh, evident scene of the heading in the middle of this world. But literally, Kadim's taken this scene person for person from a very tiny painting. And it just probably does make you think, if you've come from a, a different background, you might think of a European medieval paintings as well where you see scenes of knights in armour doing battle and so we're, we're thinking here about the same time period, we're thinking about um, people in different parts of the world and different cultures having the same types of traditions and stories but literally representing them in a different way. We've got lots of sort of the army at the top of the scene, it's like three different um, layers of imagery. Uh, depicted in the embroidery here. But there's a sort of new feature here that's crept into Kedim's work, which is the evidence of, I guess, the contemporary warfare that was happening around him when he was back in Afghanistan. So you can quite clearly see military vehicles um, occasionally, then you'll start to see soldiers in these works as well. But just the trace of them, like it's a ghost sort of over the top, just the outline. Well, we might just move up to the to Gallery 3 up here, and from there we can see both of Rees and Kadim's newest works. So this is a, um, a beautiful total installation that Arise has created for this area of the gallery here, and there's two different works. Um, we've got all the details over there of the titles of all of these works as well, and some statements by Arise, so don't hesitate to sort of read those because it's great to read the artist's own words as well, just hear my terrible interpretation of their thoughts. Um, Ariz has considered these textile works here one group um, that he's called a murmuration. So it's like the idea of a cloud of birds swooping around together, holding a pattern together, uh, and he says that he sees in that a sense of security for all those different creatures being together uh, out in the world. And that's something that he relates to as um, you know, keeping his ideas about who he is and his family very close to him as well. And on these textiles you can see a range of different motifs. Some particularly relate to um, Persian and Zoroastrian uh, rituals, particularly the new 
year ritual, the ruse, uh, which is a time of symbolism, uh, this textile here and the one on the other side, all the seven S's here, uh, relate to those stories. There's also quite domestic scenes on some of these, um, what we might call placemats, with this, for example, thinking about the silverware at home. And then the larger Dury rugs show some scenes from, um, or show uh, Ariza's reinterpretation of beautiful objects and images that he's found from Persian culture. For example, there's a lovely small Venus statue on the rug over there. Uh, so each one of these has got a particular story to it. Again, you can see that range of quite domestic cloths that he's treated in different ways and through those techniques that he's learned from his family members, but very much made his own now. And the work on the floor here is something really new uh, for this artist, a sculptural work. He has made objects before, but in this sense, uh, this work is quite different. And it's his response also to thinking about those ideas of home and place and funeral and where we're from and where we're not from the land that we're living in, which uh, many of us are not. Uh, you know, here we're here living on somebody else's land. And so in this sense, he's combined the idea of adobe brick architecture, which is what you would find if you went back to Iran now and looked at the ziggurats or looked at the ruins of Persepolis. A lot of those buildings, they look very terracotta, but they're made out of earthen bricks with straw, which have been sun dried. And these bricks are uh, raised source from Nelson, of the maker of adobe bricks, and created this sort of sense of archaeological ruin in the centre of his bricks on the top, which are really his, his personal um, connectivity as well. And they're each a key figure in his life that I've mentioned before to his grandmother, her friend 30, uh, um, his aunt Dolly, which was her friend, his mother, his sister, his own sister, and himself. So the sort of five key figures in the line and his family. So there's a whole lot of personal content in the as you can hear. Um, again, he uses that sort of fragmentary nature of storytelling and beautiful symbolism just to sort of touch on ideas in each work differently. But, Bringing these works together is like a very powerful statement of who he is now, where he's come from, um, and the way he'd like to see us thinking about a person living here but connected back to so many different people and places. And also a person who's trying to sort of challenge um, some of those hysterical, historical stereotypes as well about who you are um, and who you are in the place that you live, where you live. So alongside this um, amazing new body of work by Ariz, we have three new textiles from Kadim as well, which you can see over here in this gallery, uh, which we're really quite lucky to have. When we talked about doing the show together, Ariz decided he would create a new body of work and Kadim said, well, I've got a couple of textiles underway and then I'll also make a new one for the project in New Zealand because he wanted to come here and wanted this to be uh, a great first exhibition so these textiles, in a sense, are made by Kadim drawing out an idea and a design and then working with women who he's found know their traditional embroidery te techniques so well. They understand the right textiles to use. They give him ideas about how they think different fabrics could be incorporated in these uh, textiles and embroideries and they do a lot of hand embroidery and some machine embroidery on these as well. So it is a real collaboration um, and they do work together and Kadim does go to uh, Kabul to meet with them and uh, talk with them and uh, look at and be a bit of a teacher for them as well. Uh, and this is the way that they've been making their livelihoods. So the scenes in these again you can see uh, writ large from again miniature paintings and stories but also contemporary geopolitics in Afghanistan as well. It's pretty clear that you can see quite centrally on the bottom of these textiles, particularly the centre and the left. We've got the Taliban uh, there, the poppy fields which have been thriving for the last 20 years under the Allied forces in Afghanistan. Um, there's some clowns over the top there which are like the politicians pulling the strings, drones and other sort of overlaid military scenes. Uh, but it, we can, sort, we can see as well many, many historical elements in there. We've got lots of um, 
horses from emperors, we've got uh, people fighting in caves as well. There's a different sort of demon popping up in amongst the rocks that's taken again from historical sources. Uh, so it's a, a melange of how Kadim sees the world through these historical narratives and also what's happening for people today. And the work on the right hand side of course references again that idea that he's drawn on uh, in that earlier painting of the idea of a sort of sermon on the mount uh, and this is actually taken from a reinterpretation of a scene where a crow talks to a group of animals and asks them you know asks humanity who's going to save us and again Kadim's turned this around and included the Australian marsupials and kangaroos, but also some other traditional elements, like there's a dragon down there and the lion in amongst them as well. And again, we have those people protesting about climate change and fire. And up the top, the amazing phoenix, the smur that's found in Persian literature, which you'll see illustrated on some of the books we've got downstairs, particularly the Conference of the Birds, which was a poem, again, a written uh, in Persia to talk about the story of reaching divinity and the phoenix in a sense is like the most supreme being and it's made up of 30 other birds who have undertaken many challenges to arrive at this pinnacle of um, sort of good holiness and good goodness uh, which is in fact this phoenix figure. So the phoenix is a great symbol of a, being a saviour coming in to save people um, but here we've also got these other angels coming in with the fire hydrants. But pretty much, I think it's almost like uh, the question is, are they able to save anyone uh, now, animals or humans combined? It's great to get down and have a close look at this and you can see the wonderful work that's gone into these textiles. They have pretty much lived the history that they're talking about. Um, I've talked to many of you, and I don't want to re repeat um, but too much detail the story of these works, but basically they were made and ready to come to us in August uh, last year and our registrar Kelly, who's here, had done an amazing amount of work to uh, organise and negotiate their transport. But of course, um, unexpectedly, the Taliban came into Kabul much quicker than people thought they would and uh, th nothing was happening in terms of moving objects out of the city. So the makers went and took back the box of what were called cushions, basically, uh, and didn't really know what to do with these works because they were in quite a lot of danger if the Taliban found them with these representations, these very Western looking representations. So they had to flee the city, uh, it's quite a long story, but eventually they even got them on a bus and they took a route towards Pakistan. They took these, amazingly they took these textiles with them. Uh, they disguised them and put them in things like pillowcases and called them cushions so nobody would know what was really inside. But when they did reach Kandahar, they had to get off the bus as the Taliban was there and uh, just had to discard these objects and leave them behind, unfortunately, not, not claim any ownership over them. But um, thank goodness for a bus driver who threw them into a lost luggage compartment and they remained there at the bus station. Eventually these people were able to get some documents and get over the border where they still are now. And Kadim was able to pay a driver to come back to that bus station and look for the pillowcases and the cushions that had been left behind. And strangely enough, when the driver reached there and asked the security guard at the luggage place, um, have you seen a cushion that looks like this? It's this colour, da di da And they said, oh yes, I'm sitting on that. I'm using that on my chair. <laughs> so amazingly, that was the work on the left-hand side, the feral clowns. It's the first work to be found and transported back to Pakistan under women and children seated in the back of a station wagon and then the driver was able to also go back and eventually find these other works. There was a lot of tears on this journey. Obviously we wanted the people to be safe. We weren't concerned about the works. We can always find other works, but uh, it was an incredible story of these makers who so much wanted their works to be seen outside their country and to be shared, particularly in art galleries where a lot of people would be able to see them. So they really have had a lived history and those makers then wanted to make them look like new so they did some repairs where they'd been sort of stuck with knives, baggage had been searched many times and um, sent, we were able to send them back here. So amazing journey that um, these makers are still on in their lives and Kadim still working with them in Pakistan and looking after their livelihoods and ensuring uh, that they have the best life that they can at the moment too. So I think there's a lot of messages to take from these works. We think about what's going on in the world this week. 
in Eastern Europe as well. Um, and I guess Kadim's messages here about humanity's attitude towards humanity, historically, how that's been repeated over and over. Um, and Ariz is exploring his own personal identity and his connection back to histories as well as his family memories and um, matriarchal memories, uh, like all of us have too. And thinking about ideas of home in between these two artists, attitudes and their ways of making and the stories that they're telling us, I think it's a very fertile space, uh, hopefully you've agreed to explore uh, between these two artists. So thanks so much for your attention and coming. Happy to take any questions or comments and I do hope you really enjoy this, these two exhibitions and Chevron's work in the window as well.